So, I just want to start off by saying thanks a lot to coming to my talk, Grunting Your Way to Success. Uh, my name is John Keller. Uh, I live up in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Uh, I've been working with WordPress for uh, about eight years now, and uh, I've had the chance to talk at a couple of previous WordCamps, and uh, I'm always really excited, because there's always like something that I that I learn about that I'm really psyched to share with everybody, and it's not really the type of thing like my family or friends are generally interested in, so it's great to have a crowd here that uh, actually likes to hear about this stuff. Uh, I work kind of around the corner at an advertising agency called uh, Allen & Garrison in the Seaport District, and I get the chance there to do some really cool stuff with WordPress. Uh, we have some clients that are you know, more comfortable in like the enterprise type, you know, .NET uh, site for content management system, but we have some that are that are open to more uh, more other options that are perhaps a little bit cheaper. And as we all know, WordPress is pretty cheap, right? Um, mm -hmm. One cool thing that we did recently was we used WordPress to power the back end of an iPad app. And if you had told me, you know, nine years ago that WordPress, the blogging engine, could do something like that, I wouldn't have believed you. So it's really cool what we can do with WordPress. But at the same time, it's gotten a bit more complicated. Right? If you were to write it a theme eight years ago, uh, it would have been quite a bit easier to do than now with all the different tools and processes that we can use. So let's go back in time a little bit to say uh, around 1998. Um, this was me developing one of my first websites. You know, rock, rocking the huge cordless phone and like the 10 inch compact Rosario uh, laptop. And uh, back then, like I said, things were a lot simpler, right? There were no real standards. There was like one browser. Um, the HTML editor looked like this. I used a editor called Hot Dog Pro, right? Not like a Dolby Dreamweaver. You know, pretty pretty simple stuff. Uh, I had a huge crush on uh, Alicia Silverstone back then, so like this is what my web page would look like. You know, <laughs> yes, and everything <laughs> posted on a tripod. I'm sure like we all kind of remember that stuff, right? So as I was developing the site and I was ready to push it live, I'd be you know editing this file in Hot Dog Pro like on the server, and I was ready to deploy. And I use that term loosely because pretty much that just involved pressing Control S, right? And I was good to go. You know that was it. It was saved. All set. Nowadays though, uh, things have gotten much more involved, right? So you're ready to work on a new theme, and uh, you get a uh, comp from a designer, you know, and so you load up Photoshop, right? And they load up Photoshop. So, uh, you just kind of stay here for a while. And this is just the very first step, right? And then you take all the way through, like all the development and everything. And so now I'm ready to you know, deploy my website, or at least just like preview it, hopefully, right? So, here's what just a list of the things I took just from my most recent project. I compiled the SAS, checked the JavaScript for errors, concatenated the JavaScript, concatenated the CSS. Modify the JavaScript, minify the images, replace the calls to the non-minified scripts, remove the live reload code, added cache busting, updated the change log, updated the version, committed it to Git, uh, pushed it to the repository, and then notified everybody in chat. And by the time this is all over, you know, it's just like you do, you, you kind of feel like Dawson there, right? It's just like it feels like a huge waste of time, it's so error prone, it's really easy to forget one of these steps. Um, so nowadays, what I do is I have the command line open, and I type grunt, press enter, and that's it, right? Everything is done. I don't have to worry about anything else. It lets me know if any of the steps failed, anything like that, right? Really much simpler than doing all of those manually. And even if you just do a few of those, um, we can really improve that process. So let's start with the basic question of what is grunt? Run is a command line tool to automate tasks. So by tasks, I'm just referring to what I was talking about a couple slides ago. Things like compiling your SAS or minifying your CSS, that type of thing. Those are a few examples of tasks. Um, those are some of the basic examples, but you can really reflect and do a whole bunch of things with Run. Uh, the first part of this is a command line tool. And I know that that can really scare a lot of people off, right? Where where we have so many nice GUIs and everything to do a lot of these processes, you might think, why do I necessarily want to go to the command line to do that? Um, really, in the end, all you need to know is what I just showed a second ago, is typing the word run and pressing enter, and that's it. Uh, the configuration, we're going to do a bit from the command line, but it's pretty much all stuff that you could literally just copy and paste from the run website. So I really don't want you to be freaked out by the fact that this is going to be on the command line. Another thing that sometimes scares people away from the run is the fact that it's built in Node.js. Uh, you, know, you may have heard of Node, maybe 
mess with it a little bit. But it's just good to know that it was built in Node because some of the uh, utilities that we're going to be using alongside of Grunt come from the Node ecosystem. But I promise you don't need to know Node. You're not going to do any programming in Node. Um, you just need to know that it was built in it because you can actually need it installed on your system. Luckily, it's really, really simple to install Node on your computer. So what are the, some of the benefits of using Grunt? The two main ones are efficiency and consistency. So efficiency is not having to manually run all the, those commands, or even just a couple of them. You know, in total, maybe they would take two minutes to do that. But if you think that every time I save my website or deploy my website, I have to do those, and then we say, you know, each day I'm going to do that at least 50 times, we're looking at like 100 minutes of time on doing these tasks that, you know, really are just manual processes that I don't feel I should need to do manually and waste that time on, right? <laughs> that time really adds up. Not to mention, you know, when you're working on a site, you're really kind of in that developer mindset, and having to jump out of that to just run all these commands one by one, or just waiting for all these commands to run, can really like throw you off of your game. So, Grunt can help take care of that. The other big advantage of Grunt is the consistency. Uh, I find it's really easy to forget some of those steps when you're working on a site, uh, especially with when you're going to production and you forget to you know, reference your minified files or you forget to compile your SAS and now you're working with outdated CSS. It's pretty easy, at least in my case, to forget some of those, which would cause issues. Another thing with consistency is if you're working with a team or say you're even handing this off to a client, which I know is a little bit scary, but hand it off to a client for them to work on, you can be sure that they're going to be running the exact same steps and using the exact same tools you were when you build the site, so you know they're going to end up with the same end product as you. So you might be wondering why not use another program? Uh, I'm sure you know, if you're using SAS, you're using a SAS compiler, right? You might be using some other tools to accomplish this. And uh, they do have their benefits, and you know, a lot of them have really nice GUIs and are built into your operating system and everything. Um, but there are a couple benefits to Grunt. One is speed. Uh, I find, especially on large projects where you have a lot of files and a lot of stuff going on, time can kind of add up with this. Um, I used to use a great program on the Mac called CodeKit, which was really nice, but I found that it did take a little bit of time to kind of do all of these steps each time I saved. And I'm one of those people who will type like one CSS attribute and press save, like that's all I save. So I was kind of being bogged down by how long this process took. Since Grunt is really close to those tools because you're running it from the command line, you don't have any kind of bloat on top of that, it tends to run really, really quickly. And there's a big focus on speed, so they're constantly improving it and improving the plugins that work with it to make sure it's running really fast. Another advantage is customization. The Grunt uh, community, it's open source, and it's huge. There's just tons of people working on it, contributing to it, um, building plugins for it. Uh, as we'll see later, there's, there's just tons of opportunities out there for, to allow you to expand upon what Grunt can do for you. It's also, since it's built around JavaScript, you can write your own tasks. So if you have a special use case scenario that you want to do for a project, you could write something. And it's JavaScript, which we're pretty familiar with, so you can be pretty comfortable doing that. And the third benefit is cost. It's open source, so it's free. And that's always a kind of fair, right? So now I'm going to take you through installing Grunt on your system and configuring it for a project. So this assumes, you know, you never worked with Grind, never worked with Node. The steps are pretty much identical for Mac or for Windows. First thing you need to do is you need to download and install Node.js. Uh, that just involves going to nodejs.org and clicking the green button. It's pretty much that simple. Uh, there's no kind of command line configuration here or modifying your path, anything like that. It's a really straightforward process uh, on Mac or on Windows. So that's downloading installing Node. Once you have it installed, uh, you, you're going to open up the command line for the first time, and you're going to type this command. And everything I'm mentioning in my slides here is pretty well documented on the Grunt website and everything, so don't worry if you, you know, miss a few of these. So this is from your command line. You're typing npm install grunt -fi g So right away, you might be thinking, what's npm? Um, this is where Node comes into play. npm stands for Node Package Manager. All you really need to know is it's the way to install Node-related packages, which for us are going to be Grunt itself and Grunt plugins. So we're going to see in this npm command a lot, but for us, we're just going to use it, for our purposes, we're just using it um, to install Grunt and its plugins. 
The other uh, command here is dash G, and this is actually the only time we're going to use it, but this installs it globally, so that no matter where you are on the command line, no matter what folder you're in, uh, you can just type grunt and it will run run for you. So we now have grunt installed on our system. We can go to the command line and type grunt, and of course it won't do anything, right, because we haven't set it up for our project, but it'll at least run. So now we're going to talk about configuring the project. Each project has three main components to it that make it a grunt project. So these, are, these components are going to live usually in the root directory of the WordPress theme that you're working on. The first file is called package.json. Uh, some of you might be super familiar with JSON, some of you might have never even heard of it before. But just think of it as a text file with a uh, unique syntax that's used. It's used a lot of time with APIs. Uh, in our case, we're just using it kind of like a readme file where we're going to have the name of our project and then a list of all the Grunt plugins that we're using. So, no modules is, is where Grunt plugins come into play. This is just a folder that's going to be created and store all of your Grunt plugins. So what I mean by plugins is when you install Grunt, it doesn't actually come with anything. It doesn't come with a SAS compiler or a CSS minifier, any of that. Um, and, and that's one of the great things about it is it's really customizable because if you don't need those things on a project, you don't have that overhead, right? So the plugins are going to allow you to do that. You can install a plugin for SAS, you can install a plugin for concatenating your JavaScript or um, checking your JavaScript for errors. Those are all individual grunt plugins. And they're going to live in this node modules folder. It's good to know that this exists, but you never have to touch it. It's going to be created for you. Um, it's going to create, store all the plugins in there for you. You never have to go into this folder, but it's really good to know that it's part of this so that you don't delete it, because if you delete it, you're grunt mobile. Then the last component is the gruntfile.js. Uh, it's a JavaScript file, so you know, text editor or whatever you're going to be working with it in, and this is really the, car, uh, the uh, core of your grunt system. This is where we're going to do the configuration for it, and kind of specify how we want to run all of these plugins. So let's start by looking at the package.json file. And this is actually the only <coughs> time you're going to have to open this or touch it if you want to. Uh, every package.json file for a grunt project is going to share the same basic boilerplate code. So you can just save this as a template somewhere on your system, drop it into a project, and you'll be good to go. To just briefly explain what's in there, um, we have the name and the version. You could just set these to whatever you want. Uh, they're not really going to come into play for a grunt project. They're just required for it. And then the last line is uh, dev dependencies. And this is going to be a list of all the plugins that you have installed for your grunt project. We're going to install plugins in a way that is actually going to automatically add to this file for us. So we're never going to have to touch this file again. But I'm going to jump back to it a couple times just to kind of show you uh, how it's modified as we work on the grunt project. Um, okay, so this is our grunt file.js, and again, this is a basic boilerplate. Every grunt file is going to start with at least this. Of course, it's going to do more with this, but again, this is kind of a good template that you can just drop in there and start with. You don't really have to worry about what each line does here, module that exports and all that. That's just boilerplate code you're never going to touch. What we're going to focus on more is what's all between there. So. Don't get too intimidated if you don't recognize a lot of these commands because you're never going to have to really mess with them. So now let's talk about installing the plugin, right? So we have our package.json file and we have our grunt file. So everything's kind of in place, but it's not doing anything yet, right? So we want to install a plugin. So the first plugin you have to install for a grunt project is grunt itself. And I know this is a little confusing because you might think, didn't we just kind of run this command? What we installed earlier was the grunt client, which allows us to actually type the word grunt and execute it from the command line. What we're installing here are the actual grunt source files, which will do the compiling of the grunt file for us. So this you can install on every project. You might see it kind of looks familiar what we did before. It's npm install grunt dash dash save dash dev. So npm installs the same. Grunt is the name of the plugin, which in this case is just grunt. And then save dev again, what that does is this will update the package.json file for us. So I mentioned the package.json has that list of plugins we're using. By adding this uh, flag onto the end of the command, it's going to add this plugin into that list. So if we look back at package.json, we can see that plugin grunt is now in there. So again, it did this automatically. I just wanted to show you how it did that for us. So 
now we're at the point where we have our package.json, we have our runfile.js. The known modules folder has been created for us at this point, and it's, it's stored the run plugin itself in there. But again, not really doing anything, right? We haven't configured run in any way. If we run it, it'll run, but it won't really accomplish much. This is where we're going to go out and start getting some of our plugins. One of the awesome things about Grunt is its plugins page is fantastic. Uh, no offense to WordPress, but their plugins page can be a little tough to navigate, right? Partially because there's just so many of them. But it can be a little tough to kind of browse through things. Grunt is really great, it's really fast to search for something you're looking for or to just browse. Um, you can see that there's currently 3,416 plugins, which is kind of mind boggling that there's that many tasks people have wanted to automate. Admittedly, a lot of these are really uh, one-off scenarios with a couple of downloads that you're not going to use, but there's so many in here for really anything your imagination can come up with. Somebody's probably written a grunt task to take care of it, uh, to take care of it. and uh, I'm going to show some of my favorite grunt plugins a bit later, but we're going to show some of the standard ones that you'll often be using on a lot of your projects. So you see that list there? Um, you can only see one plugin at the top, which is called contrib.js hint. But the one that we're going to be installing is called grunt contrib concat. Um, just a quick side note, when you s all the plugins are in the format of grunt dash whatever, some have contrib in them, and that just means that they're officially maintained by the grunt team. So they're the ones at the top, really common ones, and uh, so that's just what the contrib refers to there. Uh, one really great thing too about the plugins uh, on the readme page here is that they all start with the ex exact same paragraph text about getting started. All the plugins are installed in the exact same way, but still every time they remind you how to install them, which is really great when you're first working with Grunt and you're typing these new commands and you might kind of forget about the syntax and everything for them, they always remind you how to install them right at the beginning, which is great. So this is a concatenation plugin, which as you can see, concatenate files. So say we're working with a whole bunch of JavaScript files, a lot of you probably are already doing this. It makes, uh, it's more efficient to combine those all into one so that when you reference it's on our page, we're only making one network Right? So it's a performance boost. So let's go ahead and install that concatenation plugin. Command for it, hopefully this is beginning to look kind of familiar. From the command line we type npm install run contrib concat, which is the plugin name, and then the flag dash dash save dash dev. And this was taken right from that readme page, pretty much just a copy and paste. If you look at our package.json file now, we can see that plugin is listed there automatically. So again, I didn't have to do this, it did it automatically, but I just wanted to show you that that's there. So let's get to actually configuring this plugin now that it's installed. We're going to open up our gruntfile.js, and you can see we have kind of the boilerplate that we had before, and we added this new line, grunt.loadnpm tasks, and then the plugin name. So the very first step after you install a plugin is you're going to add this line to your grunt file. And all that does is it tells your grunt file, hey, we're going to use this plugin loaded into the system. If you didn't load it, you would get an error when you tried to run this task. So even though it's installed, you still have to add this line in there. So let's look at actually configuring this concatenation plugin. <clears throat> I'm going to remove kind of the top and the bottom of this code snippet just so we can focus on just this concatenation plugin. So we start with the name of the plugin, which is just concat in this case. And then we have dist. So dist is my own term. Uh, well, it's actually the term from the readme file. You can call it foo, bar, dev, <coughs> excuse me, uh, production, whatever you want. This is your own name. This is something called a target. So what a target does is it allows us to set up different configuration based on the environment we're working in. So for example, you could have two targets, one called dev, one called production. Because in a lot of cases, you're going to want to, in this example, concatenate different files depending on whether you're working on a development server or a production server. In this example, to keep things simple, we only have one target, which is our distribution target, right? So we're saying, let's take these three files here, intro, project, and outro.js, and combine them all into one, this file here, build.js. So you may think, well, how did I know to set it up all that way and use that syntax? Again, this is just right from the uh, plugin readme page. They're really great about not only kind of documenting what all this means, but giving you a lot of different examples. So one of the other examples is, how, how do I use a wildcard if I just want to concatenate all my JavaScript files? How do I do that? There's an example for that. So when you're first using Grunt, a lot of this might not look familiar, and it'll take a while before you're more comfortable with, like, what's the order this all goes in, that type of thing. But you'll get more used to it, and the plugin pages are really helpful for this. So let's zoom out and look at our whole Grunt file now from 
from top to bottom. We have our boilerplate at the top. We have the tasks we defined with our target called dist. The source files we're going to be concatenating file if concatenating together into this destination file. Then we have the load npm tasks where we're loading this plugin in so we can actually use it. And then we have this line register task. So we have register task is called default, which is actually like a, a, a standard grunt term. And that means if we go to the command line and type grunt, we want all of the tasks listed after default. So in this case, the array just contains one, which is called concat. So that says if we type grunt in the command line, run the concatenation task, which we define above. You could have multiple register tasks. So like before, I was talking about different environments, right? I have one for dev, and I have one for production. So in a development environment, you don't really care about minifying your files or minifying your images, some of that stuff. That would just take up extra time. What this allows me to do is have a just the simple bare bones stuff that I need for development, which is like compiling my SAS or my less. And then for production, I'm going to do a whole bunch of stuff. So it lets me do different things depending on which server I'm working on. In this case, we just have this default one, which is just in cat. So let's get on to actually running grunt. Like I said, really simple. Go to the command line and you type grunt. And that's all you need to do, right? So this is the output based on that grunt file we have. It says running pincat, which is the task name, and disk, which is the target. And then it said created this file for us. So if we were to open up that build.js file, we would see all of our three files combined into one there. And then it says done without errors. If there was an error somewhere, it would have let us know and it would have failed. Made it, but made it very obvious that it had. So we have our concatenation tasks up and running. Usually though, you're gonna have at least a couple of things you're gonna to wanna to do on a, on a theme, right? So let's install another plugin. Process is gonna be really similar. Um, let's install one for SAS. If you use less though, the procedure's gonna be really, really similar. So we would go to the Grunt.js website, go to the plugins page and search for SAS, right? Click on the readme and it'll tell us how to install it, which is exactly the same as the previous plugin we were working with. npm install grunt-sas run dash sass dash dash save dash dash. So hopefully now you know this is becoming more familiar to you. If we jump over to our package.json file, we see that plugin has been listed there as well for us automatically. And it's also been installed in that node modules folder. But again, you don't have to mess with either of those. Let's look back at our grunt file.js. So again, the first thing you do after you install a plugin is you add this load npm tasks with the plugin in. Uh, a quick aside, there's actually a Grunt plugin that will automatically do those load npm tasks for you. Grunt is so efficient that like, it makes itself more efficient by doing this type of thing. It'll load any plugin listed in your package.json file. Um, so just kind of an example of how you can really streamline this whole process. To keep things uh, it's more straightforward though, I'm just showing you how for each plugin you install, you're gonna have this load npm task for you. The other change I made is under our register task for default, I added a new task there called sets. So now I'm telling it when I type run, so on the command line, I want to run both the concatenation task and the sats task. Now if I ran this right now, it would error, right? Because we have the plugin installed, but we actually haven't told it how to do anything yet. I just like to add this at the beginning so I don't forget and run runs and not figure out why it's not running that task for me. So let's go ahead and define that task we just installed. We have our concatenation task above, right? All we do is we just add a column after that brace there. And we define our new task. So you see I, I, we have our new uh, line in here for options. Almost all grunt tasks allow you to specify um, options. Some are can get pretty complex in, in terms of letting you configure a lot of different things. Um, others are much more straightforward. So for example, one of the common options for SAS is do you want the output to be just normal or do you want it to be Press, which is basically just minify. So here I'm able to specify anytime I run this SAS task, I want it to be compressed. And you could add multiple options there depending on the plugin. Again, really documented well on the plugin reading page. Then we have our target, which I call the same thing, it's dist. And in this case, all we have is a list of files, which are just two files here, our scss file that we want compiled to our main.css file. Uh, how did I know to put files and then put the CSS first and SCS second? Again, it's just from the readme page. It's the type of thing that you're gonna get used to when you work with Grunt more, you'll know, okay, put the CSS first, SCSS second. But for now, we're just pulling this right from the readme page on the plugin. Back to running Grunt, same exact thing. 
type going from the command line. We have the same concatenation task at the top. And now we have our new SAS task below that. And we've created our CSS file from that SCSS file. So right now, in a couple minutes, we installed Grunt. We have it up and running. And we have a few basic plugins installed. And so you can really get up and running, especially with a simple Grunt file, very quickly. Um, of course, on a lot of projects, you're going to be doing more than just these two tasks, right? So all you're going to be doing is thinking, well, what do I want to, what can I automate in this to make it easier for me? And you just go to the Grunt plugin website. I spent um, a couple hours when I first was messing around with Grunt just going down page after page, sorted by downloads, and seeing what are people using this for? How can I incorporate this into my project? I ended up with like 25 plugins, and it was a total mess and really overwhelming. So I would recommend maybe taking a little bit slower than that. Um, but that's the process you're going to do, right? You're just going to go plug-in by plug-in, let's compile the SAS, let's concatenate the files, let's minify the files, that type of thing. So this is really just the beginning. I want to share with you now a couple of the plugins that I use um, that I find both really helpful and, and really cool in like a super nerdy way. Um, the first one is called grunt on CSS. Uh, this is especially useful like on big projects. You know, like you're working on a six month project and it's getting closer and closer to the launch and you're getting like lazier and lazier with your CSS file and it's becoming messier and messier and you know, you're having a lot of classes in there that you're not actually using anymore. What this will do is it'll look at your CSS and then it'll look at all the HTML pages for your website. And it will find anywhere in your CSS where you're not actually using a class and remove it from the compiled file. So that's a really great way of getting rid of all that bloat and extra classes in your CSS file that you're not actually using. And it will just do it on the compiled file. It won't actually remove it from your source file. <clears throat> this next plugin is called Grunt Photo Box. I think this is just so awesome. I found this a couple weeks ago. And I love what it does. Um, when I'm working on a website, you know, and you're working on the CSS, and you change something, you, you know, fix a bug on, on a layout somewhere, a lot of times what I find will happen is something completely unrelated, this is a CSS, right, and I'm really good at doing this, will break. But I won't notice it necessarily because it'll be on a different page or further down the page, that type of thing. What this plugin will do is it, it'll not only take a screenshot of your finished website for you, but it can take a screenshot of all the pages you want, and it can take screenshots in multiple resolutions, so you can see desktop, tablet, and mobile. And it'll actually show you the difference between the last time you ran Grunt and the current time. So it'll immediately pop out at you anything that changed on the website that you weren't expecting. So as an example of this, here's a website I was working on, and you don't have to see the, the details, but you can see um, I have on the left the last time I ran Grunt, and on the right the current time. And in the middle, it highlights the differences. So in this case, those two images in the center change, right? If that was accidental, immediately I would have noticed that something else went wrong there. And then it does the same thing, so I was able to specify 320 resolution, and now it shows me the differences here. And this happened automatically, right? And when I typed run, among the many other plugins it was running, it fired up a server on its own and took pictures of my website and saved them. And I, so I also have this like historical screenshot archive. So that's a, that's a really cool plugin. Another useful plugin is called Grunt Text Replace. This can do a lot of generic tasks for replacing tests, text. So one example is, you know, locally I'll just be referencing my full .js files production, I'll be referencing my .min.js files. This, when I run my production task, will go through and replace any calls to .css with .min.css, which is really handy and helpful in terms of making sure you don't forget to run that. Another really great thing that it does, um, if you ever work with clients and you, know, you make a change and they're like, oh, I don't see the change, and then you say, oh, did you press Control F5 three times, right? Like, how many times have you had that conversation with clients? Um, this, what it'll do is it'll add cache busting to your links automatically. So if you don't know what I mean by cache busting, basically if you have like link href equals main.css, if you add a query string at the end, so like question mark, um, one, two, three, four, the browser will think, oh, this is a new file, I'm going to reload it. So what this plugin does is it automatically adds random characters at the end of your calls to your CSS and your JavaScripts, so that every time you make a change on the website, their browser will automatically refresh it, and you'll never have to have that conversation. So that's a really handy plugin. Uh, 
going to put your watch. This I actually consider essential to be uh, to be in your grunt project. So far in the examples I've given, I've talked about how you go to the command line and type grunt. Um, doing that every time you make a change wouldn't really be efficient, right? And that's kind of the whole purpose of grunt. What grunt contrib watch allows you to do is it allows you to specify, hey, I'm working on CSS files, JavaScript files, PHP files. Every time I change CSS, I want you to, or SCSS, I want you to compile those SAS files. Every time I run JavaScript, I want you to concatenate those files together. Every time I modify my PHP, um, I want you to you know, do whatever you want to do for PHP files. Um, what this will do is it will automatically run a run in the background whenever you change those files. So all you actually do when you first start working on a project for the day, you go to the command line, type run, and that's it. You never actually have to work with the command line again unless it pops up an error somewhere along that process. Run will automatically be running in the background, just waiting for a chance to run itself after you've made some modifications to your file. Another thing Run Contrib Watch does is it incorporates Live Reload, which you might use on some other projects, but basically Live Reload is a single script tag you add to your page that whenever it detects changes, it'll automatically either refresh your browser window for you if it's like a markup HTML change, or it'll just inject the CSS without even refreshing the page. So here's an example of changing the background color to red. You can see the browsing window just automatically injected that CSS without having to refresh or interact with the browser at all. The really like mind-blowing thing with this is if you're doing responsive design and you have you know, your desktop, your tablet, your iPhone, your Android, your Galaxy, your window phone, Kindle, all that kind of stuff, and you press save in your editor, they will all just magically refresh. And you'll show it to somebody and they'll just kind of like not know what's going on. But I think you guys can really appreciate how magical that is, right? You see all your devices refresh and just feel like a master of the universe in a really pitiful way, but it's still really cool. Um, so that's Grunt Contrib Watch. Uh, Grunt Contrib Imageman uh, is image magnification. So before this, I had been you know, opening up these 20 megabyte JPEGs in Photoshop and you know, changing the quality and everything, saving them one by one. There's third party tools that you could do this, you know, you drag and drop and it minifies them. Grunt takes care of that automatically. It'll, it'll minify your um, JPEGs, your PNGs. Uh, it'll show you a nice report at the end. Um, so you just point it to your image directory and it'll run it and it'll say, hey, I just saved you, you know, one megabyte by compressing all these images. And again, it does it automatically, right? You're never going to forget to do this. You're never going to end up with a 500 kilobyte image that someone posts one at you about in the web inspector, right? It'll do all this for you automatically and it'll never forget it. And then the last plugin is Grunt Conventional Change Log. So this is, this is getting a little bit more nerdy, but um, if you use Git for a version control system, you know, you're working on your site, every time you make a change, you make a commit, and you say, you know, bug fix, you know, uh, fix this error on the home page, or feature, added a new slider to the home page. What this plugin will do is it will go through all of your commits from the last time you ran run. It'll put them into a markdown file, if you've used markdown before, not, no worries. It'll convert the markdown file to an HTML, and then it will generate something like this. So this is generated every time I run run, right? It goes through my commit, my git commits, and it says, here's the bug fixes I made, here's the feature changes I made. So if a client asks, hey, did you fix that, or what have you changed on the website recently, or if a project manager asks that, I just point them to the link to this live HTML file, and they have a list of everything that's been changed. Also really useful for myself if I've broken something recently, and I could just quickly look and see what changed there. So we now have you know, set up our front file with all those plugins, right? It, it might take a while to configure those and install all those. And now another developer comes up and says, oh, hey, I, you know, I need to work on this site. Uh, super, super simple to hand this off to them. All you do is you give them the files like normal, right? And in those files, you just include the package.json file and the run file. All they do is they go to their command line and they type npm install. And what that will do is that will look at your package.json file, right? So this is where it really comes into play. And it'll install all of the plugins listed there. And then all they do is type run, and immediately they're not only up and running, but you know they're running the exact same tools as you and ending up with the exact same product. So super, super simple to share it with people and really have a lot of consistency with your developers or their clients that are working on this. So of course, the most important question is WordCamp, right? How does this all integrate with WordPress? Uh, it's actually really straightforward. There aren't any kind of like conflicts with running front on a WordPress theme. 
um, because WordPress doesn't really have any standards about how you have to structure your theme, you know, for better or worse, it's more dependent on how you decide to build out your theme directory. So if you just have a, a you know, folder for CSS and a folder for J uh, JavaScript, all you do in your gun file is you just say, hey, here's where my CSS files are, here's my JavaScript file directory, you know, concatenate these. If you have uh, all these different folders, you know, like library assets and then CSS, JS, you're just going to be modifying your gun file going to those instead. So it's really much more dependent on how you set up your WordPress theme rather than anything that WordPress forces on you here. Uh, so that's the end. I think we got about 10 minutes of questions. Um, also, feel free to ping me on Twitter at John Heller, and uh, I'll post the slides and then eventually the video on my website, which I noticed the last time I updated was last year's talk, so it should be really easy to find this one if you never update my website. So thanks a lot for coming. Hope you've learned something. Okay, so the question was, if I have CSS that I push up and then the client modifies it remotely, um, how do I kind of incorporate that into this process? Um, yes, that could be challenging, besides completely locking them out, which might not be the best uh, business tactic. Um, really, that's, I mean, I think that's more of a question related to like source control and Git and that type of thing. Um, what I generally do is if I know somebody's modifying the files live on a server, I'll just uh, have a grunt test, for example, that pulls those down to my server and commits them so that I make sure I never overwrite, it, overwrite them, while at the same time I now have like a history of those changes in my own project. Um, but yeah, that could, that could be a little bit tricky to handle. Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, how do you set up like the, the director tabs and folders and all that? I mean, you're not just living your team folder? And yeah. All yeah, great question. Yeah, so. You might be able to configure it separately, but generally what I always do is I just have the grunt file.js and the package.json file in my um, root directory, right? And then, um, okay, I'm gonna go rogue here and, and show you a code example if I can manage to do this on the two screens. Because um, I, I did want to kind of show what a fully fledged uh, grunt file looks like here um, while working on two monitors. So just give me one second. Okay, so here's a WordPress theme, right? Uh, you can see this is the root directory of it. I have like my front page stuff, PHP, all that kind of stuff. And here's my um, grunt file. So um, this is a grunt file that I built on for a while. So there's like a lot of stuff going in here. I didn't really want to show this because I didn't want to scare anybody off. <laughs> I totally went crazy with my plugins, right? Yeah, it's kind of nuts. Um, but in terms of pathing, um, what I actually do is you can set up variables at the top. This is JavaScript, right? And so in my template, I have these variables for my SAS path, CSS path, JavaScript path, path. So in this case, it's, I store them all in this library path, right? And then whenever I run one of my plugins here, um, so, okay, so here's my SAS plugin, right? In my development environment, I'm saying the source is that SAS path, which is library slash SAS. And then this file that I'm compiling to this file which goes out to my CSS path. And so you could see that is um, kind of represented here on the left. So I have, um, where they go? So I have my SAS path is library, so I put up library and that's CSS. So basically everything is just a relative path to where your run file is, which in my case is just in the root directory and it makes it really easy to just reference those files. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Uh, other questions? Yeah. That's a good question. I've approached that before and I've kind of run into issues where because there's been just enough slight differences between the themes, what I found is instead I have this template here that I made as reusable as possible and I put it up on GitHub and that's why like, I have these variables at the top that I set up and that makes it really easy to just duplicate the grunt file because 
if, if you end up having to do too much customization, customization I found, um, based on like which project you're working on, it could get a little bit hairy. So I just thought it was easiest to create a template that's really, really reusable. Um, like one thing I'm working on is making it easy to enable and disable plugins, because like not every project might use this. So I'm like I'm still tweaking that. But yeah, I just like working off of a template that's really easy to um, reuse. Make sure it's not removing like what you need. Yeah. Okay. So the yeah. Um, so the question was a task like on CSS. How do you make sure it doesn't remove something that's, that's going to then break your site? Um, that's more I think just having faith in that particular plugin. Um, while it is a run plugin, on CSS is actually more um, of an open source plugin that's used in other scenarios. I think you could like I think you could go to their website and run it on a site. So it's not just a grunt plugin, which is kind of good because that means like a lot of other people are working on it and make sure it doesn't do things like crash your site. Um, I've had more issues whereby the site is just so huge and has so many extra classes that it just gives up and, and breaks. I've never actually seen it remove something that was vital. Um, but if you look at on TSS, there's a lot of options in there, so there might be something there to configure it to maybe err on the safer side. Right? Any other questions? Great, and again, feel free to ask me you know, later on or on Twitter or whatever if any questions come up. So, thanks again.